Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Today's podcast is for March 30th, 2024. This is the podcast for the vigil of Easter. Um, We don't do this every year. It's been a while uh, since we've done our last uh, reflection on uh, the Easter vigil. Our texts are the first reading, Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4a, Exodus 14, 10 through 31, 15, 20 through 21, Isaiah 55, 1 through 11, Daniel 3, 1 through 29. The New Testament reading is Romans 6, 3 through 11, and the Gospel is John 20, 1 through 18. For those of you who are saying, why do we have all these Old Testament readings? Well, the Easter Visual actually has 12 readings, and we um, look at a portion of them each time we reflect on the Vigil. And uh, so uh, if you're doing all 12, or if you're doing the Old Testament, which I read, um, we're going to talk today about some possibilities for that. So what do you think, Gang? Yeah, it's a lot of texts, and I think this service is usually fairly quiet, subdued, and and it creates a lot of space for silence. And so uh, a sermon should not be at the expense of that. But at the same time, I think um, sermons are really are really useful on a day like today to help pull together some themes, but also I think even more so, you know, to set a mood. Like this is not a day for sermons with a lot of answers. I don't think it's a day for sermons with a lot of exegetical detail. But I think it's a time to, um, I would say that your job as a preacher is to see this as a time to enchant the day and to not, you know, not exploit people's or manipulate people's emotions, but to bring an attitude of, of reflection some somberness, but also I think some attitude of deep hope in God. And so the, you know, the texts that we've chosen to highlight with commentaries this year are all things about God's power over something, whether it's the primordial chaos at creation, or it's the fury of, of um, an enemy like Pharaoh or uh, Daniel and just a idiot king who's, who's, uh, who's dangerous as well as stupid. Uh, or even something like Isaiah, where it's just the power of futility, you know, and the idea of a word of God that always accomplishes something. That's where I would go, at least, not to do every text, but just to kind of set that mood. So tone of voice is really important. Presentation is really important. And how you open up these texts to be serious, yet at the same time, um, a little bit insanely hopeful, (laughs) right? That's my thought, at least, if I were preaching the Easter Vigil this year. Yeah, I I really like that, Matt. And I, I, when I was thinking about this podcast on the Vigil, I had a couple of things in terms of, like you said, creating the mood or, or setting the tone for the evening. And I know that there's like different orders for the text. And when I was on internship, we did Easter visual, but I haven't been in any tradition since, since that I've done it. And, but I, I take my cue from, uh, this is going to surprise everyone, John 20, uh, and see that coming, but, (laughs) um, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and, maybe just like stopping there, you know, of, of, of what would it be like to have that text, that first part just read initially and uh, came to the tomb. And the other, because the other thing about this passage is that she comes to the tomb alone and uh, doesn't come to anoint Jesus, doesn't come with spices, she doesn't come with anything. And I think that could set a certain kind of tone or mood that we just go to the tomb so that she can 
say goodbye or that she can, why do we visit the graves of our loved ones? And so there's that sense of, you know, coming to the tomb, it's dark, you arrive at the tomb and, and, and just there you are. And, but like you said, Matt, with the anticipation as well, that, that even that death can be overcome because of God's power. And uh, so, but how do we create that, that space, that in-between space of being alone at the tomb and not knowing yet what, you know, not knowing quite yet what's going to um, be on the other side. The other thing I thought of was maybe not having one sermon, but like little homilies on the, on the text, you know, maybe one, just, just a, maybe just a paragraph or not even a paragraph of, of tying some of those themes together. So you're not having to do, you know, one sermon that's trying to pull it all together, but like how each text, like you said, Matt is speaking into that particular theme or what, you know, what I suggested. That's, that's another like form in terms of uh, logistics. That's another idea I had for this year. Perfect. That's a wonderful segue to what I wanted to say. I knew I wanted you to go first. I try. So, <laughs> so one of the things that uh, preparing, I'm going to use that word intentionally for this year's Easter visual, is really doing the preparation um, and maybe considering what Caroline just said and what Matt has presented before is um, that to do it in segments, one of the um, Easter vigils, one of the first Easter vigils I participated in uh, used all of the readings. It was an, an extended service uh, filled with uh, mm-hmm. interludes of music and media and a spoken word. And uh, so however you choose to uh to have your community gather for this vigil. I think if you take this idea of uh, the short homilies, the uh, little pieces that would weave together, think very carefully about the mood or the idea that you want to thread through the entire service, and then work with your uh, musicians and uh, your uh, readers and uh, to say this is this is the mood, this is the direction we're going in, and then um, maybe take a little bit more time to actually uh, develop a presentation uh, that isn't um, moving toward a full sermon, but that is actually um, dotted along the way with text that describe or set up this moment for us. Uh, I think that would be creative uh, for persons who uh, think they know this story, but haven't had it read in its context. And this is an opportunity to do that. Yeah, my experience of vigils have been, I remember on my internship site, they started at sundown. Where, yep. uh, and so it was like 537. <laughs> You know, uh, so whatever sundown was, that's when it started. And, you know, they were, and they were about three hours. Right. And, uh, and, but it's like you said, Joy, it's less about, it's less about that proclaiming word as it is about, I think that, uh, as you said too, Matt, like about that mood and about that tone and just putting people in that space, of, of, of waiting and, and, and anticipation and, uh, and, 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 and wonder of what, of what, of what God is capable of doing, uh, and even, even overcoming death. Um, and so it doesn't, it doesn't take, the texts are a lot of words, so it doesn't, I don't know if the preacher has to match, match the number of words of the text. How about that? (laughs) Yeah, I, I just I, I I I'm less interested in the Romans text and the John text than I am in the Old Testament text, for the purpose of kind of remaining within the Easter drama. That th- they do pose the question. Put together those Old Testament texts, I think, do pose the question: uh, What enemies has God yet to defeat? And the answer there would be would be death. Uh, 
which, you know, Paul says in Romans 6, and that's there, but I, I almost, so you are in a sense, you're preaching the resurrection because everybody knows what tomorrow morning is, but you're also walking through, walking people into that mindset, like what, with Mary, why is she going to the tomb? There's no particular reason she appears to be going. Um, but what she's doing is something that's familiar to a lot of us, right? Going to visit a, a, a grave, going to going through somebody's things after they've passed away. I mean, all the things that we do to, here's a modern word, process, whatever is going on. But I do like the question of the way the Old Testament text, you know, says, remember which kind of a God we're talking about here. Remember the God who's made certain promises and has done certain things. Um, I'm not saying you can't do the New Testament text, but I don't think this is certainly not a day to ignore the Old Testament text. I, I agree. That's the context. And uh, uh, Caroline, you used the word wonder, and I really loved, Matt, you, you used the word enchantment. Um, and so if we start with this idea, uh, even, even if you take uh, a start with John, Mary's arrived. But what are the things that would go through your mind to bring you to this moment? Not just the immediate um, morbid event that is, you know, highlighted on Good Friday, but the God that they had put their faith in, the God who had made them promises that they had begun to believe in uh, again because of this first century Jew. And now he's gone. What now? And and so, bad as you said, each of these texts puts this moment in context. And we too often leap, we've said this before, leap right into Easter, right into resurrection. Um, we have the whole season of Easter. We have all the other sermons uh, to tell this story because of the resurrection. But sometimes we need to linger in the why was there need for this moment at all and just realize just the, the, um, uh, that this is a climax because of the horror, uh, because of the trauma, because of the political disruption, because of the cultural chaos, because of the uh, brokenness in relationships and families and person. And that is all that they would be feeling in this moment because of the death of their teacher. But it has a cosmic uh, consequence. And that's what I think the Old Testament text that you're talking about, Matt, put us in the context of this cosmic uh, climax. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, I recover yeah. the enchantment. And you can live that out. So, you know. Uh, ben, who's the, the the guy behind the scenes here at uh, Sermon Brainwave, has shared that he was at a, an Easter visual once that ended with a feast and even champagne. So you can, you know, you can have these culminate in a variety of ways, depending upon if you want people to go home feeling solemn or if there's something. But that I like how that then imprints Easter onto a community. I don't know if we want to talk about any particular texts here, but I, I love the Genesis text as as, as imprinting Easter onto creation and onto the patterns of creation with, with night and day and with the first day being something significant. I like the way Daniel maps Easter onto politics and onto the, the, the danger of, of certain rulers. Uh, other things, I know, Carolyn, you've already said John chapter 20, I think if you preach on John 20 Easter Vigil, you probably can't. I think there's a rule somewhere you can't preach on it Easter morning then. Well, that's why I would only stop at 20, 20 <laughs> and not even do all of 20. I, or I, just one verse. Just, yeah, you could well, do one verse every Sunday. Half of a verse. I would only do like <laughs> half of a verse. Yeah, because you want to, it's only, only, only to put us in, in Mary's shoes, so to speak. Yeah, we've all come to the tomb, empty-handed and empty-hearted, yeah. and Ooh. and and here we are, and uh, and as you said, Matt, the uh, the the way in which all of these texts then speak, and you too, Joy, speak to you know this cosmic God, <laughs> Creator God, who is unbelievably, miraculously 
can't even can't even under you can't understand it uh, going to overcome even death, and that's that's I think where we need to be on this night. And uh, the Exodus text also talks about the weakness of empire and the systems that empire sets up, the weakness of all of that in the presence of this God. The gumming up of the wheels of the chariots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love, right? The idea of stopping those wheels, right? Stopping the, uh, the productions of, uh, of, of an army and of an empire. And I think I would also invite our listeners to give themselves the same space that and that they don't have to they that this is not a service where they have to have to do it all. Uh, actually, worship is never um, all about the preacher, but particularly on this night, uh, that they that when what what difference would it make for their own preaching the next morning to sit in this space as well mm-hmm. and, uh, and with with everybody who is there and how does that how does that then touch you, affect you in your faith, in your trust in God, uh, in your in your spiritual <laughs> your spiritual realities. So that's that's one one last thing I would say is that the preacher also just be there and just be outside that tomb and um, and sit in that space as well. <laughs>